stress, you can have rest. You see, COVID-19 created a condition called fear. And fear is what paralyzed the soul. So this morning, I have a two-part presentation. Part one this morning and part two tomorrow. And I want you to really, and I got a handout, I will give you some notes this. So I want to read a statement from Ministry Healing, page 115. Uh, every person should have that book, no matter who you are, where you're from, what church you belong to. That book was put in my hands 45 years ago and changed the whole trajectory of my life and mission. Notice what it says. Our Savior words, come unto me and I will give you rest are a prescription for the healing of physical, mental, and spiritual ills. You know, for 34 years, we run a, a health center, and I've come to the conclusion in the last seven years, <clears throat> people come places for wellness naturally. You know, there's a definition of disease. I'm going to just cite it and give you a pur purpose why I say this. This is found in Ministry of Healing, page 127, 128. It says, disease is an effort of nature, and I know some of y'all know that, to do what? To free the system from conditions that results from the function of what? Now let's say that once again. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that results from the violation of the laws of health. Why do disease come? Violation of the laws of health, whether willfully or ignorantly. Keep that in mind now. All diseases, all diseases comes from a violation of laws of health, whether we're responsible or not responsible. That's the word of God. Notice what it says here, that he has a prescription for that. Though men have brought suffering upon themselves by their own wrongdoings, he regards them with what? Even though we bring it on ourselves, we have a merciful God. I think about David as he brought from the sheep hold to be king. You remember David, one of the greatest king ever walked in Israel. But David was a murderer, an adulteress. Now, when you think about David, now, some people say, well, David was a man at God's own heart. Not in the beginning. No, sir. When you think of David, a murderer, an adulteress, and you think of your sins. And when you read Psalms 51, David felt deep repentance. He had to suffer the consequence for that sin. But God raised him out of the pit of the mire. So there's no sin in our lives that God does not have a remedy for. Amen. People get distressed, say, I've sinned, and there's no hope for me. You've got to look at the word of God. You will be sitting there. I know I would be not standing here if it wasn't for the manifold mercies of God. So God says here, he said, regards them with pity. In him they might find help. He will do great things. He will do what? For those who what? Trust. I know those words are concept. But let me give you a brief definition of trust. Faith is trust. Keep that in mind. Trust meaning that I will relinquish my right of governing the affairs of my life into the hands of a sovereign God that knows the beginning from the end. Keep this in mind. Trust is relinquishing your right. Any man been in the army? Anybody been in the army? Raise your hand. All right. I see my son there. So you've been, you've been, oh, ladies too, huh? Now, when you go, went to the army, my dear sister, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> come on, talk to me. You can say, well, I want to bouffant my hair this way. I want to, hello? You cannot do that. They tell you how, what hair do you wear, what clothes you wear, when do you, hello, when you use the bathroom, when to get up, when to sleep. Are you with me? You are under the jurisdiction of somebody else. That's the army. We serve a sovereign God. Trust me, you raise your white flag, surrender your weapons of treating people the way you want to treat them in exchange for God's weapons. You get what I'm saying? You got to know what trust is. Don't talk about trust. Let it be manifested. Now, listen to me. You will have some experience. Circumstances will come. They can be for you or against you. So God will bring you in contact with irritable, frustrated, unlovable people. And you say, man, they so, you know, they irritate me. What well, God is allowing that situation to happen to you because he want to manifest through you to that irritating purpose, 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 person, the love of God. 
And you take it personal. That's why we're going to go through this in a moment. Because if you're not secure in your walk with God, everybody's going to get up, be on your nerve. Are you with me? And we can't finish this work if you still got nerves. <laughs> have you heard people, have you heard people say, have, have you heard people say, he's on my last nerve? And when that person tells me I'm looking at them and they still talking. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Stinking thinking produce smelly lives. Stop listening to the lies you tell yourself. Two thoughts cannot occupy the same space. So therefore, you got to put the word of God. God gives us a promise. He said he will do great things for you. Huh? That's what God tells us, great things. In the book, Minister Healing, once again, page 17, it was Christ's mission to bring to men complete restoration. That's the journey we're on. Then he goes on and says, he came to give them what? And, and physical, mental, and spiritual. Wholeness. Completeness. When we get to that point, then we get that seal of God. You on the journey. I'm on the journey. And we don't take one step forward and two step backwards. If you're going to fall, fall forward. On your knees. Life does not have a remote. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a remote? Lord, I got some property. I got to get out of the mortgage. Click. <laughs> Come on, talk to me, huh? That, ch that child invested all my energy into it. Now look what he's doing with it. Lord, change him. Click. God, my wife... She just don't understand me. Click. <laughs> Husband too. The Ministry of Healing. That's a book I highly recommend. It, it contains the great wisdom of the phys great physician. Nine-tenth of disease are spiritual. Let this register now. Nine-tenth of disease are spiritual. Notice what it says here. It says Satan is the originator of disease. And the physician is warned against his work and power. If there was no sin, would that be cancer, no. No. diabetes, no. mental depression? No. Therefore, the root of all sickness is sin. All right? Now, who's the originator of sin? So when people come to our house, and I have come to the conclusion the last seven years that this work that we're doing is not a natural work. It's a spiritual work, and therefore it's more than potatoes and massage and juicing. You didn't get what I'm saying. It has to reach the heart. It has to set free from the bondage of Satan, has wrapped their minds in his clutch. I remember there was a gentleman that came to the center. He was fourth stage prostate cancer. He was in another faith. Wife had passed away several years ago. He remarried. And he was still living with anger, bitterness, and resentment towards God. So he recommended come to the place. And as I shared with the staff, I said, this work is more than just the mechanics. God has to be manifested. So now remember what the statement said. Now remember what it said. It says Satan is originated of disease and the physician or the medical missionary worker is warned against his work. So when a person comes with disease, you're not dealing with disease of the body. You're dealing with a disease of the heart. So this individual, after one week in the center, going through the experience of the therapy, but the most important thing is ministering to his heart. He came to share his testimony. He said, I thank God. Now listen, four-stage cancer. I thank God for cancer. Now Why? He was set free from bitterness, unforgiveness, anger. The man lived. I can tell other stories. Those who are medical missionary work is a spiritual work. You got to have a connection with God. Even if the person died with cancer, but if it's, he, he died in Christ, you've been successful. I learned that years ago. One of my students went gone ho sent him to a place to work. God, cancer cases. Person died from cancer, 
They left the work because they assumed. But the Lord brought me back in contact and showed, you must change the trajectory of your teaching. Because the ultimate goal for God's plan, he wants to spend eternity with us. Because that first death is a comma. It's not a period. Are you with me? Very important to understand that. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths. What's nine-tenths what's nine of 100? Ninety percent. Name me a disease. Nine-tenths of those right here. Doesn't mean you think cancer. It's that there's a biophysiological chemical response through the brain as a result of fear. Hormones are produced in the brain, turbocharged through your system, hitting your adrenal gland, hmm, producing cortisol, adrenaline that suppresses your immune system, inhibits the production of insulin, and I go on and on and on. So this is not just theory. There's a physiology behind that. Very important. So therefore, we find in this wonderful book, say I like ministry, I love it, because that book is what brought me to Jesus along with a book called Steps to Christ. Notice what it says. The relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes with it. Notice what it says. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Intimate relationship between the mind and the body. You get up at night, go into the restroom, hit your big toe. Ah! So the brain said, mouth say, ouch. Brain said, hand, grab, toe. Are you listening to me, huh? That's an intimate relationship there. You can't separate those two. Notice what it says here. Many of the diseases which men suffer are the result of what? Mental depression, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down what? And to invite decay and Death. My body connection. So I went on and to give a definition of those terms. Grief, emotional suffering caused by disaster, an unfortunate outcome. And I'm, some of us here have suffered that before. Listen to this. Anxiety. Oh, that's the number one thing in Christian life. Christian with angels heart. I've been in this work for 45 years. For 38 years or 45 years, I worked with an anxious heart, anxiety. Go to bed every night at 9 p.m., still do it. But for, first, for 38 years or 45 years, I go to bed at 9 p.m., would not go to sleep to 2 a.m. in the morning. Why? I'm ruminating what took place today. Now I got to project to tomorrow. I got to have my I's dotted, my T's crossed. I got to have everything in place. When I walk on my house on that campus, there are my brothers and sisters waiting for Jackson with answers. I don't know nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you don't have to have a ministry. Some of you go to sleep. Now I'm not talking about you go to sleep. That's fatigue sleep. You know, people say, I don't have that problem. You tired, you exhausted. That's not good sleep. But at night you sit in ruminating, planning. Because I'm a planner. I'm a, you know, my mind runs. Don't shut down. Between the hours of 9 p.m. and 12, your mind goes through what they call a glymphatic process. It detoxifies at night. So if you're not sleeping, your brain is not detoxifying. Anybody listen to me? Now, because I'm not going to go through the next, now seven years now, I still go to bed at 9 p.m., but I go to sleep. I don't take no work to bed with me. Are you listening to me? Wake up early in the morning, spend my time on my knees with my Lord. And when I walk on the campus, somebody, you got an answer? No, we're going to pray. Let's pray. Prayer is the answer to every problem in life. That's not Jackson quoting that. That's the spirit of prophets. Are you listening to me? Prayer. I don't speak no more until God gave me permission to talk. I'm not your solution. God is the solution. That's my problem, trying to be a solution. Couldn't even help myself. Hello. Discontent, a sense of grievance, dissatisfaction. I tell you, folks, I, I should be discontent. 
You know why? You know, we, we bought two vans. We're going to ride another van. I got over three feet of leg. <laughs> Ain't no way I'm going to be sitting in the seat for eight hours with my legs feeling numb. I get on an airplane, you know, it's going three hours all right. But going from America to New Zealand, you're talking about from California to New Zealand, that's 15 hours. Can you imagine if I don't have a good seat I'm standing in the middle of the seat with five other people on me for 15 hours? When they pick me up, they leave my legs on the floor. <laughs> when I go to places like Thailand, all my, my, my blessed friends in Thailand, they were tall as my ways here. So their door jam is short, you know what I'm saying? And if you've got a lovely wife, she's not here. She's out there putting up stuff, so don't tell her what I'm saying. So when you go overseas, you don't take a lot of stuff because you don't know where you stand. You stand on the ground in the tent. So I'm carrying three, four suitcases to the room, and I'm bending down. And I look up. I knock myself out cold. Are you listening to me? You tell me I'm not discont discontent. Hello out there. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. It says here, it's, now, what I'm doing here, one minute of anger suppresses your immune system for six hours. One minute of sanctified laughter, Proverbs 17, 20, improves your immune system for 24 hours. A smile on my face, I'd like to hear sanctified laughter, you know what I'm saying? I'm serious. One minute. Just think one minute you angry all the time, don't eat, no, not eating good food, not exercising, not sleeping right. You wonder why you're sick. That's what it says. Remorse. Distress arising from a sense of guilt, self-reproach. Especially those of us parents, we raise the children in the faith, they go astray, we beat ourselves up. Remorse. Instead of going to God, confessing your mistakes, going to your child and confessing what you did, and seeking forgiveness and cleansing and moving on by God's grace. Remorse. It's called that a pity party. Beating yourself up. And finally, distrust. Distrust. To have no confidence and suspicion. You know, we just, my wife and I just celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary this month. I met my bride from Saturday at the age of 17, but I did not get married at 17. It was seven years later. So we've been, married, we've been knowing one another for 57 years, married for 50 years. And therefore, if there's no trust there, and we've been in the ministry together for 45 years, trust. If there's two people I can trust, number one, my God. I know I trust him. Supremely. And I trust my wife. With my life. That's building a relationship. Follow me now. Christ in John 10.10 10 says, I came to give you life. Life more abundantly. But the thief said, I come to, what? He come to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Christ came to give us life. And life more abundantly. Listen to that, says. All right? So if the devil comes to steal life, then he must come to steal mental health. Hello out there. That's his job. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Whoever got a loud voice, just quote it out for me. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Just shout it out with a loud voice. Anybody like to do that for me real quickly? As we navigate through this. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, fear. but of power and love and of a sound mind. That's what God said. A, not a spirit of fear. A sound mind. We got to have a sound mind if we're going to finish this work. Now, someone look at 1 John 4.18. Project it out for me. God wants us to have a sound mind, not the spirit of fear. There is no fear in love. All right. But perfect love Come on now. Fear has Come on now. That's all right. Now, keep what we read as we go through our time here. Because we're going to look at part one, God-given inner needs. God-given inner needs to help us to have that sound mind. God-given inner needs. Now, here's some questions we want to cover finally today and tomorrow to answer. Rather. Number one, what is at the heart of all of our behavior Everything we do, there is a reason why we do what we do, whether good or evil. I, I, you understand my question? What's at the heart of it? Number two, 
How does this affect our relationship, brother, sister, cousin, marriage, folks, working relationship? What's at the heart of it? And number three, we find from a clear understanding of these God-given inner needs, how can we begin to experience a life full of joy, peace, and purpose that God intended for us? And I would declare that in these two sessions, you will find the answer. And at the same time, it will be to you use your free will to allow God to give this to you. Keep this in mind. Let's go on. We're going back to the Genesis. Now, I have a handout, so don't try to draw this part. I got a handout I'm going to give you, but I'm not going to give it to you now because I need your undivided attention. Is that all right? All right. Back to Genesis. There's a triangle up there. At the top of the triangle, at the apex, is God. To your left, that's Adam. At the base of that triangle, you find two words, alone or lonely. Now, God did not create two human beings at the same time. Hello out there. Now, if I'm speaking some contrary, don't let me stand here. Say, Brother Jackson, I disagree. It's all right with me. I don't know about the rest of folks. God created one human being. One human being. Right? Therefore, God invested in that human being some very important qualities. Now, slide over and I'll come back to this. This is what he invested from, to Adam. Number one, love. Two, identity and purpose. Number three, self-worth. Then security and happiness. So at Adam creation, he had the capacity to love like God, and he was love. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Lord, whether it's man, wife, or friend, Lord, send me somebody that I can love. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Oh, uh-uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Now. You prayed that prayer, anybody? Or do you, you pray... God sent somebody not to love you. All right. You got one person. Now, you, uh, you, you, you prayed that somebody, God sent you somebody to love, right? I see your hand. I pray that God sent me the ability to love everybody. Okay. But, that's, that's good. That's good. But what about God sending you one person that you can love? Oh, all right. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay, okay, you take all my time. I see, I see I'm going to stir up the pop in here. All right, you pray that God send you somebody to love. Now, if I sit down with you personally, I'd like to see how you peel that up. Because it's very important what you're saying. And that's what God wants us to do. But you got to understand because when you ask God to send somebody that you can love the way he loves you. You ain't hearing what I'm saying. I'm serious. I know we should love. We should love everybody. I understand that. That's a theory to us. God, listen to this. God did not create Adam to love God. God created Adam so he can love him. You ain't getting it. You're going to get it. You got to understand this. You got to understand this. It took 45 years to get it. <laughs> That doesn't mean it takes you that long. It's just self gets in the way. Uh huh. Let's go back here. Let's go back here. Remember this. Because I know time is moving. Let's go back. Now, my question is, was Adam alone or lonely? He was alone. Very. I heard some over here. I heard some over here. I'm old, but not cold. Come on now. Talk to me. Was what, what, what? Come on, come on, folks. I'm getting you prepared for your next folks here. All right. So therefore, which I heard somebody say he was lonely. Okay, okay. No, don't don't respond to the question. Just good. She said he was both alone and lonely. Somebody said lonely over here, and then the group said alone. Now, what does the Bible say? Read the book of Genesis two. It's not good for man to be lonely. You better turn there. You better turn there and find what you come on. Help me out. Help me out. Huh? 318? 218. You better turn there. You said these here talking error. 
Did it, anybody found it? What does it say? Read it. It's not good for man to be what? Alone. Where you see the word? Where you see the word lonely at? Come on, Teresa. Where you see the word lonely? Show me where it says lonely. It did not say that. This thing going all over the world. It did not say that wherever you are out there. Adam was not lonely. Now the difference between alone and lonely. Alone, here we got a folks with in the tent. Alone is a physical state. Lonely is an emotional state. Everybody leave the tent. Jackson is alone, but he's not lonely. Lonely is emotion. Now we got a crowd here. You sit here having a good time with the messages, but there's still something in your life is missing. The peace. The joy. Am I making sense to this? One person out here. Adam was not lonely. He had been invested with the attributes of love, identity, purpose, self-worth, security, happiness. Are you getting this? Therefore, now when it says we're well, not good for Adam to be alone, I'm going to make him a help me. Now remember, I asked you a question. Have you ever prayed that for God to send you somebody to love? Come on, talk to me. So God created Adam that God can love Adam. And as a result, that love, it reciprocates from Adam's heart to want to express that love not to poochies and birdies. He needs another human being, Marlon. It doesn't have to be marriage. It can be relation. He created another human being like because Adam's all, everybody, every creature had a mate. And God created another human being that God can pour his love through Adam to that human being. He did not create a human being to give Adam love. He gave Adam a human being so Adam can love. Ooh, expressing the heart of God. Therefore, we go on this side. Eve. We know the story. How did God create Eve? First of all, the steps. Put him out in a deep sleep. Now, when I read this many years ago in, in my infinite age of word, and that was my question, my lady. I said, now, God did not have to put Adam to sleep to make Eve. I thought about that. You listen to what I'm saying. He did not have to put Adam to sleep. So I began to ponder. Why? I had to go back to the template. God created man first. And what did he give to man? What did I say? Can anybody remember? Love, identity, purpose, self-worth, security, and happiness. Did you get that? Adam. So our God put the man in a deep sleep that did not exist. That he could spend, listen to me ladies, especially ladies who got husbands into work and et cetera, he put Adam to sleep so he can spend time with Eve. That he will impart to Eve the same qualities that he gave Adam. Love, identity, purpose, self-worth, security, and happiness. Therefore, Adam received all that from God. Eve received that from God, not from one another. That's why, ladies, you don't have to be worried about li women's rib. I mean, women's, women's lib. <laughs> That's a tongue. You need to ask about Adam's rib. Because you already made somebody. You already had the qualities, the spirit. That didn't, you were unique. You did, God did not bring, hello, special, hello, I say that. Eve did not run to Adam say, Adam, oh, I need I need the uh, Eve. I need. I need. God brought two whole persons. When people see me say, I saw your better half. I start looking up, looking. I know I'm a slim guy. I said, <laughs> Marla said, man, I, <laughs> I said, no, brother, my wife is not a half. She's a whole person. She has her own spiritual identity. 
Are you with me? And the purpose of a, a person like me in ministry is a woman can lose herself in her husband. I am intentional not to let my wife do that. Sometimes it gets pretty tough. Get really, you know, but you know who you are. Are you following me so far? Now, let me give a little bonus for married folk. Now, E was made the backbone, the toe bone, the rib. And the purpose of the rib is to protect the vital form, the heart and the lungs. Therefore, that woman was designed to protect the heart of man. Amen. Hello out there. Oh, wait, 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 before you men start clapping. <laughs> Eve, Eve is a type of the church, Jeremiah 6, 2. Adam is a type of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, marriage... The purpose of marriage is to protect the heart of God. Now, some of you guys sit down. What does that mean? The, that means, brother, if you're married, when you treat that wife in a very disrespectful way, you're not touching her. You're touching the heart of God. Before I speak anything that is destructing my wife, I got God in view. It's his heart. His heart. That my marriage must protect God's heart. Hmm? Well, if you want more information, come to our marriage retreat in October. <laughs> I'll give you some information. <laughs> that was not a commercial, man. <laughs> Are you with me so far? So therefore, let's move on. So we receive these very qualities directly from God. Man and woman relationship from God. You got it? You're going to get this sheet. I know you're writing. It's all on this sheet. So let's move on as we come on down to the closure. Now, God given inner needs. We have all been created with three God given inner needs. Three. All right. Number one, love. It says here to know that someone is unconditionally committed to our best interests. Unconditionally. Number two, significance, to know that our lives have meaning and purpose. And number three, security, to feel accepted and have a sense of belonging. Now, all this on your sheet with the scriptures, because I'm going to move on. I don't want to overstep my time. So I'm going to get this to you. You can take pictures, but you don't have to write it down. I've got a handout for you. All right, move on. I put it in three A's. Adoration, that's love. Affirmation, that's significant. And acceptance, that's security. We find that all of our behavior, all that we do is a pursuit to have these three legitimate needs met. And we do it in illegitimate ways. Do, do you hear what I just said? Yes. These are legitimate needs. But we pursue them unconsciously or consciously in illegitimate ways. Number one, why, why, why do people get married? It's, they can look for love, security, or what have you, right? I'm, I'm from Chicago, grew up in the inner cities. Why would young blacks or Spanish folks, young men, join street gangs? They're looking for love, significance, and security. Why would a young adolescent or teenage girl having a sexual affair with this gangster, looking for love, significance, and security. Why would we tattoo our body? Why would we put pierce, body pierce? I used to look at that with disdain. I don't look at it no more. They're looking for love, significant, and security. All of our behavior is predicated upon those three needs. You don't have to be a psychologist to understand that. I talk to dozens of people every week with these struggles. And then when parents come to me, they have problems with their children. They said, my daughter's a problem. I said, that's very interesting. She's your problem, huh? Mm -hmm. I said, let me share with you now. Do you have a problem? Yes, I have a problem. Now, listen what I'm saying. The child is not your problem. The child has a problem. 
you got to get this. The child is not your problem. The child has a problem, and you have a problem because of the way you respond to her. Are you with me? So therefore, we got to put the problem in the right perspective. You see it through your own lens of your own pain, your own experience. Follow me now. You're not seeing as God sees. When God sent Samuel out there to choose the king, he said, don't look on the outward, look on the heart. The child is struggling. When I finish talking to folks, you find the child is looking for love, significance, security. And as a father, go with me to Psalms 144, verse 12. Turn there real quick. I'm going to talk to you about that real quickly here. Psalms 144, 12 is coming down. We find that these three needs are indispensable to development and growth in ministry like this. Ministry we have, you find individuals, young and old, struggling with these needs. And we attach ourselves to places and things because we're looking for those three needs. Anybody understand what I'm saying? I know that. I come close to the food. I come close to the workers. I know that. All our reaction. And Psalms 144.12 gives us a template for child rearing. It says, sons will grow up as what? Plants Plants in their what? In their youth. Daughters should be like cornerstone, polished at the similitude of a palace. Now, the key word there to me is plant. The home, according to the word of God in Genesis 1.28, The home is the foundation of society. There's two institutions that are under attack. The seven-day Sabbath and the home. Malachi said it's going to restore that. Now, that, it says plants. What do plants need? Water. It needs soil. 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 If the soil is poor, Brother Carl, if the soil does not have the right nutrients, the plant's going to grow weak. So the soil of the child is the home. It's what the father and mother put in that soil. Do you understand what I'm saying? That wickedness does not start at 20 and 30. It started at the moment of conception. It's what we, I have a couple of children, I have great Great children, etc. I know how I messed up with my older child, but God restored that. It was a problem. I was trying to cut her into the truth, dress her, eat right, right, and then I know how to invest emotionally in that child's life. Men folk grow up, we gotta we gotta go to work, bring forward the food, good housing, you know, everything, kiss the baby, rock on the knee, toss her out, go to work. <laughs> Hello, am I right, Ma? I'm serious. We don't. We 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 to the ground. We don't know how to invest. It says the soil, and I'm gonna tell you something. Those of you who have fathers who have maybe they grown now because I know a, a a female daughter gains her perception of life through the eyes of a father. And don't, and those who grow up with a father, let's come on back to part two. You'll see. Because as a man, I grew up without a father. I live in a matriarchal father, family. I'm the eighth child of eight children. There's only two of us living today, the oldest child and the youngest. And my o- the oldest child is 100 years of age, and she is now living with us. She had raised me. She's 100. I'd be 75 in December. So it's only two of us. So now the youngest is me to the old one. You get what I'm saying? And so I realized what it means to come up in a single-parent home. But we'll talk more about that, how God brought me to the truth. Are you with me so far? We find then that home, that girl connect with a father. The father got to go back and have God to just re-educate their old mind. They're not too old because my daughter was older too. And I was trying to look at her. I said, she got a problem. She ain't accepting this. And God said, you have a problem. She's not a problem. You have a problem. Are you listening to me? I fell on my face and confessed, cried out to the Lord. I said, look, I'd like to spend a couple of days with you. We go rent a cabin. And that's what I did. This has been years ago. And that day we sat down. I looked at her and held her hand. I said, will you forgive me for not being the father that God wanted me to be? And we went on. And today, if you meet my daughter, it's like nothing happened. She's in 50 now. We've got grandchildren. we just like that. 
Every year we still go on a daddy-daughter's date. God restore for the canker worms and the caterpillars and the locusts. If we line ourselves over God, adoration, affirmation, and acceptance. At the heart of behavior is an attempt to get our legitimate needs met in illegitimate ways. You see, by growing up in Chicago without a single father, without a father rather, I thrust myself into sports. I was a decent student. So I said I'm going to be the greatest basketball player ever came out of Chicago. I ate, slept, and drank it. All the men in my life was coaches. You get what I'm saying? Coaches. There was no real dad in my life. So go on and says here, the Bible calls this sin. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end, in the end, it leads to death. We're seeking consciously or unconsciously. Three, three needs, folks. Let it settle on your mind. It goes on to say, why did God give us these deep inner needs, knowing that people fail people? It says here, for example, some parents are harsh, cruel, abusive. Marriages crumble due to unfilled genuine. While every person has been created with these three inner needs, no person is able to meet our three needs. Now I'm going, but there's another catch to this. It says, realize that if one person meet all of our needs, we will need God. Now, the ultimate need meter. The Lord planned that he would be our need meter. The Apostle Paul revealed this truth by exclaiming, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this? What? Then he answers his own question in a strong way. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 7, 24 and 25. It says here, all along the Lord planned to meet our deepest needs for he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. We're going to come back tomorrow and going to go deeper into those three. Significant. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Security. I will never leave you. Never forsake you. Keep that in mind. God. That's God speaking. Now, as we can close on this, it says here. Sometimes the Lord would meet certain needs by himself. Other times he would use other people as an extension of his care and compassion. I'm going to close out with a story. Then I'll give you a handout. This is to be true. Now, I said, how many, what number child I was? And I grew up in a single parent. No father in the house. Therefore, I never met my father. Never at that time. So, mother trying to raise some children, scrubbing floors, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's why I purposed my heart to, to get education. And I said, I thought as a young black man coming out of Chicago, one of the quickest ways is you can sing. I cannot carry a note in a suitcase. <laughs> Or play basketball. So I had long legs, very agile, so that, uh, agile. So I purposed my heart. I said, I want to be a great basketball player. For two reasons. Number one, for pride. And second, for money to get my mother in a place where she's comfortable. So I did. It was pretty good. But however, fast forward this situation. I remember when I was in college, and I won't get into all the details, and I began to develop a very bitterness and hatred for my father. Never met the man resentment, thought about the burden that was on my mother, and just a devastating welfare, you name it. I just, I said to myself, I said, if I ever found this man, I'm going to give him a piece, you remember that piece of your mind, your last nerve? And so God never brought me in contact with that man until I had a, a walk on that Damascus Road. When God really broke this heart of mine and brought me to the cross. I was 27 years of age when I gave God permission to take this heart. When I became a seventh day Christian. It was at the age of 30 when I got into this work. And I was down in Alabama because I, I was born in Alabama. A little place, I won't name the city. 
You might go and try to find out for that. I left Alabama at the age of four and grew up in Chicago. So we conducted some meeting in Alabama, not too far from where I was born. So one of my associates was coming back. I said, you know, we're not too far from the home that I was born in, the town. Now, my mother never had any bad things, one thing I say about the father. Describe him. His, his mother wanted to adopt me, but he didn't have no other children, no other child. Remember, no other child. He's married. But that's the story himself. So he was a deacon in the Baptist church in this little town. So I had to come up with a plan. I had to come up with a plan. I didn't want to disrupt his current situation. And so as I inv investigated, found out where he lives, and therefore I went to the door and rang the doorbell. Ring the doorbell. A lady answered the door. Now this was my plan. And I said, does deacon so-and-so live here? She said, yeah. Who's calling? Well, we're here to uh, evaluate, assess the church outreach to the community. And I hear that deacon so-and-so is a deacon in the church, and we want to talk to him about the situation. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> As it was all over, it, I did have to ask for forgiveness. Hey, hello. He came out. 30 years came out. On the porch, reach out, grab him. We walked off the porch into the yard. I stood there like I'm standing at Brother James. I grabbed his hand. I said, I mentioned his mother name. I mentioned several other things. I mentioned my mother name. I'm just watching his face. Then I held his hand. I said, and I looked at him. I said, you got a granddaughter? I'm doing very well. I want to let him know I'm not there for some dough. I said, I'm only two reasons. Two reasons. I'm coming to this last point with this extension. Two reasons. I first had to clear the King's Highway because this man was living rent free in my head. You ain't hear what I'm saying. Because I was holding on to bitterness and resentment. And every time I think about it, it pops up. So I had to give him eviction notice. So I held his hand. I looked in his eyes. I said, I forgive you. Then I said, I need something from you. I clutched his hand. It was a defining moment. I said, will you forgive me for hating you and resenting you? A year later, he died. Time later, we moved from Chicago. I'm down in Huntsville, Alabama. Big house and et cetera, et cetera. Two dogs on the land. I'm going back to here. Sometime, God used others as an extension of himself. I was set free. I was set free. Hopefully, my father died in the Lord. Hopefully. But I know at that moment, a ton of weight came off my shoulders. 30 years. So now God is orchestrating. That's why circumstances do not have to work against you. It can work in your favor if you understand. I'm there in Huntsville on the property. Two big dogs. Two German shepherds. One is named King. He's a black, jet black. When he stands up on his hind legs, he's seven feet tall. He put his legs, paws on a Volkswagen. He can rock the Volkswagen. The other one is called Princess, like Ren Tin Tin. They're born on that property. We live on the hill. Nobody come up the hill. Bikers don't know who up there. They come on their dirt bike. And King, there's gorilla eyes. And they see King, he goes that way and the bike goes the other way. I'm serious. Nobody come up that hill and get out their car unless King knows they family. So one day, we get a knock on the door. Nobody knocks on the door. My family, we don't lock our doors. What's going on? I go downstairs, my garage. I look. There's a well-dressed gentleman. It's a black guy. I open the door. He stretches his hand out. I'm not looking at his hand. I'm looking over his shoulders. What I'm looking for? 
I look for my dogs. <laughs> hey, my dogs are not, they were not watchdogs. They were guard dogs. You see, I know some of you guys got watchdogs. They watched the thief come in. They, they weigh the, they the, they weigh their tail and, and point that way where the safe is. That's a watchdog. Are you getting it? My dog is a guard dog. Nobody get out of their car and out of their car and walk two inches without their limbs torn off. And here's a guy standing there and my dogs are not there. Guns. And, I, and without me being said, man, how do you get out your car to my dog, my door? Now, I'm from Chicago. The gentleman said, yeah, I saw your dog. I said, how do you do it? He said, I, they saw angels around me. I, I said, what? <laughs> only, thing, only angel I knew was hell angels. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not, this, this is true, exact words. So he heard about a house because it was a nice house. He said, he introduced himself. He said, Can I, do you want to sell this house? I said, no, I won't sell this house. Do, I mind, do you mind me looking? At, I, I carried him through the house, showed him everything. He came out and said, you're a nice house. I said, I'm not selling. He said, that's all right. He gave me two books. So I knew he was not a particular religion. I knew that. Because the books were Steps to Christ <laughs> and Bible reading for the home. And then he offered to pray with me. I said, this is a strange bird here. So he prayed with me, gave me a card. He walked out there and said, no, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm going with you. He said, it's all right. No, I'm going with you. So I walked him out to his car. He drove off. Princess and king came back. <laughs> <laughs> are you listening to me, huh? Those are guard dogs. <laughs> they came back. What's the story? That gentleman, 40-some years ago, was a gentleman who became my spiritual father. He was an extension of God's compassion. My family lived with him over several years. Because of that gentleman, I'm a seven-day Adventist today. The man alive, 91 years of age. Now he's living out there on our property. It says here, sometimes the Lord will meet certain needs by himself. And other times, he would use what? And I've seen that as a result of me being a recipient of that love. That love has come back where I have been an extension to other young men and women. I take dear to heart, not only in theory, but spiritually and materially, whatever I, my little, what my little life can do. Because God flow love in your heart not to hold on to it. So when we come back tomorrow, I want to just cover these. I pray what is done for me will do for you. That we can live a secure, loving, happy life to finish this work. And so therefore, we have, uh, let me see, Brother Carl, Michael, could you help out? Uh, if we don't have enough, we can get some more. These are the notes from this morning. Probably if, if they in families, get one per family to eat, okay? Anybody have any questions before we close? Call if you go. Any question, comment before we close? Can anybody tell me what three things that you can remember from this morning? Anybody? Raise your, you got a mic? Somebody got a, we got a mic. We want three. Tell me something. Go ahead, dear. Being an extension of the care and compassion. That's good. That God. Praise God. Any, that's, that's, I like that. All right, right here, my, MK. Yes. We, we all have needs, but God is our need meter. God is our need meter. Anyone else there? Yes. Oh, sh oh hold on. Pray if you're single. Yes. Pray that... Uh, God will send you somebody that you can love. Amen. Pray that God send love. That lady right in front of them. We got a gentleman back there. We got here. Praise I love him. the three A's. The, uh, the adoration, affirmation, acceptance. Many people don't receive that. And they feel of no value. But God and all, all of us as women and men 
God gave each of us values. So Amen. Like Amen. We got a gentleman back there, and then we got a sister over here. Praise God. Both Adam and Eve were happy individuals. They Amen. Didn't need their security coming from no Come one on else. Come on now. Amen. They come from God Himself. And they were able to share that with someone else. Got a hand right up here, MK. Praise God. Boy, it's good. I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. Actually, because you mentioned, well, let me just ask a question. How then do you identify the needs of your children so mm. that you can actually meet, meet those needs and not Very good. go off with your own thinking That's what right. you think they need? Very good question. How can you meet the needs of children you don't know? Now, remember this, my dear sister. You're learning now they have those same needs. Love significant, and security. Now, as I close out with this, there's three parenting styles. Three parenting styles. There's Christ-centered parenting. Christ-centered. There's parent-centered parenting. There's child-centered parenting. If you're not Christ-centered parent, you're not going to recognize. Now, I grew up in a parent-centered parenting home. Let me give you an example. Boy, don't you embarrass me. <laughs> don't you embarrass me. Now, when I was successful, my, mo my mother was successful. When I became a seven-day Adventist, it broke her heart. And when I took all my trophies from my so-called sport days and realized they were nothing but idols and tore them up, that broke her heart. You see what I'm saying? That's parent-centered parenting. Their success is dependent upon your success. Child-centered parenting is the child is the focus. Christ-centered parenting is that you're operating on biblical principles and raising your child. You will know these three needs. It's not the fact when I know they do need them. Now we need to say, Lord, how can I show that? We can talk later on that. How can, you understand what I'm saying? All right? Praise God. Are we, are, are we willing to just give God the opportunity to just come in and say, I pray to hell this year. Yes, you got to close. You, Marlon. Marlon. You said each person has their own spiritual identity. Yes. Then as husband and wife, how do you become one? Oh, how did Christ and God become one? Submission. Submission. But did they lose their uniqueness? No. no. That's the beauty about that. You maintain your spiritual identity, the one in heart, in purpose, in thought, in action. You're still unique. So how do people miss the mark then and, and one person becomes mm -hmm. sort of melded into the other? Like That's right. Said. Because Christ wanted to bring, he said, Father, I pray that they be one as we are one. It was his purpose to bring his disciples in unity with himself. When you, it's like a circle, as inspiration said. In the middle, as we come, each one of us come close to that circle, we come close to one another. So the only way that can take place is that person got to be abiding in Christ. See, we're not in a natural world. We operate on a spiritual plane. When my wife and I, I cannot say, honey, we got to be one. That got to be a conscious decision for her to connect intimately with God. So We're trying to figure it out because we educated. That's our problem. We're too educated. It's simple. So when you come one with Christ, it's going to automatically take place. No other way to be done. We can have further discussion on that. We got one other thought here. We have word of prayer. Thank you for your input. I know you don't have much time, but I want you to elaborate on that part where when you said fathers get so successful mm. that they're busy, they're just running, providing. That's right. And I wanted you to comment on how do you, uh, you know, have, give, give your children that emotional security that they need. And balance. Uh, you might not have enough time. Yeah. Know. Well, question that we can, husband, that, you know, we're busy. I tell my staff, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not busy no more. I'm on a mission. You know what that word busy mean? Being under Satan's yoke. You see, Christ was on a mission. You remember when he was going to Jared's house as a result of him commanding Christ to come and heal his daughter? There was a crowd all around him, and there was a woman in the crowd with the issue of blood. You remember that? She was trying to get to him, and Jesus, Jesus did not change his direction. He, she, he was still going to Jared's house, but he was going, he was sidestepping 
woman there to help that woman to help to exercise faith. So busy is mean that we are tied up in our own selves. And so we got to have time. We got to have boundaries. That's 24 hours in a day. Give eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work. You got another eight hours. What are you going to do with those eight hours? And so to invest in a child, you got to sit down and be able to talk with them. You got to let them share what's on their heart. Instead of you sending, you know, you got boundaries in your house as far as your word of God, but you got to have an ear. You know, you got to be quick to listen. And you have to hear what they're not saying when they talk. You got to go beyond words. And that is something that God will show you. So we got to carve time out, James. We got we to set time out. You be working eight hours a day on the job. And you're tired, man. You're beaten. You come home. You just want to take a shower, kick your feet up. And then we might get on the computer, what have you. But we're going to have to be intentional. And so God will give you grace when you purpose it. Lord, I know I got to spend time with my child. And if you got a girl, you know, like some, take time. I'd like you to take your wife out, carve time out, special time for each one. Even though our children are grown, I still now, 50 years old, daughter, daddy's date. Hmm? And now being grown, before she make a move, she calls now. She said, Dad, I got to have a daddy prayer. I gotta. And so that came through learning from default. But I had to call time. I got to be intentional. Don't come home and daddy don't come home and just, oh, daddy miss you. Kiss. Oh, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. That's, for, that's, that's formality. You know, you ain't spend no time with them. Then you say, well, Sabbath, if you're a Sabbath keeper, uh, that's our time. Uh-uh. It's, it's every day you got to have a moment with them. Spend time. If they're grown now, let's find out what they're interested in. Use your skills. How can you help them? My daughter now want to help the grandson, want to invest in the business. She called me. I said, let's look at this situation. Let's look at the time you living in. You know, let's find out what the God wants you to do. How can we help? You know, talk, communication. Spend time with it. Two-way street. But don't be the one always talking. We'll talk more. <laughs> That's the way I was, man. Thank you all for the interaction. Pray that's been a blessing. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Let's have a prayer. Gracious, gracious Father in heaven, thank you. I am present. I know Father spoken to these hearts. These words become more filled with flesh. That when we you speak through any of us, forming lives. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.